And uh, it's a great pleasure to have Professor Abe Despande here today from Stony Brook University and also Brookhaven National Lab. He's the EIC Science Director of uh, Brookhaven National Lab and actually will also be Director of the Nuclear and Particle Physics Division starting, I think, in July. Uh, Abe has a long history in particle and nuclear physics. He comes from India. He studied in Mumbai and then uh, for the masters you went to, I forgot now. Uh, Kanpur, yeah. Kanpur, yes, yeah, actually. Uh, then went to Yale University in the US. Uh, he was a Riken Fellow. Uh, that's a, a fellowship which is between Riken at Japan and Brookhaven National Lab, where he stayed. Uh, that's his um, postdoc time and uh, uh, first uh, young researcher uh, position. And went on at Brookhaven and Stony Brook, where he is now a distinguished professor. Um, we know have been knowing each other for a long time, actually. Uh, early on, we were competitors. Uh, he was at CERN doing spin physics at uh, SMC, later on at Zeus at DAISY, where he was at uh, one of the competing experiments. I was at Hermit at DAISY. But now, I think for the last uh, 10, 15 years, we have been uh, engage in uh, a common project, the Electron Ion Collider, where, which Abe will talk about a lot today, uh, which is a um, new machine which will be built at Brookhaven National Lab, the new basically a frontier machine for QCD studies. And uh, you can see already the title or subtitle, Understanding the Glue that Binds Us All, which is a uh, uh, the theme of that uh, collider. So Abe, the stage is yours. All right. And, uh, Thank you very much, Gunnar. And I'm very happy to be here in the Basque country. And Bilbao, particularly, I was supposed to be here eight years ago for a meeting, and uh, somehow I couldn't come. And I've been, we've been planning this trip for almost that time. So I'm really, really finally glad that I'm here and able to talk to you. And I'm going to be talking to you today. So you can talk back. That's the question, that's the, that's the message here. So what I'm going to tell you about is the electron ion collider. It is a new collider that we are now building at Brookhaven National Lab. And for the age group that I see, that's wonderful here. It is probably the only collider that will get built during your time as young scientists. And it will operate during your peak time as, a, as scientists. Uh, there are other colliders being planned, but the way these things are in high energy physics these days, opportunity comes every 30 to 40 years. So here is what I'm going to be telling you about is your opportunity to get involved and make your mark. So it's really serious. I'll, you'll see what the timelines for this project has been. So you're the luckiest one of them all, this, this age group, I can tell you. Um, what we are going to try to do is to tell you about understanding the glue that binds us all, and it is... It has meanings, so there's a literal meaning and there's a figurative meaning, and hopefully by the end of the talk you will understand why I say that. Uh, it has been a long journey. This started in the late 90s when we were competing in spin experiments. He was at DAISY, I was at CERN, and uh, we noticed something that we needed, uh, we were doing fixed target experiments. He was doing electron star scattering on fixed target, I was doing muon scattering, and we all, around the world, globally, we came to an understanding of the limits of that better. And so we had to change something. And what we wanted to change was to go to a collider mode from a fixed target mode, where the target is fixed and the electron comes and hits it. But in this case, you're going to see that the target is moving in the opposite direction as the electron at very high energy, and that has some distinct advantages. So I'll, I'll describe to you as to what they are and how that allows us to go into regions which we have never seen before in, in, in space inside the proton. Yeah? So, so I, although the idea started in 1996, in my mind at least, uh, the formal acceptance of that project happened in the United States in 2015. So that's right away 20 years later. 20 years later, the project was accepted by the community as something that needed to be done. Now, that has been already eight years since, since the acceptance. And we are now starting clo coming close to the construction. So what happened in 2015 and 16 was the community accepted 
this as the project. Then it was evaluated by an, in, uh, an August external committee. This is a multi-billion billion dollar project, yeah, multi-billion euro project, which means that if I say I want it and I convince my community and we all go to the government, they say, okay, take the money. No, that's not. They will go to another independent body and that normally for the United States government is something called National Academy of Sciences. The National Academy of Sciences is an independent body which has physicists, chemists, biologists, historians, um, artists, everyone. And they have to be convinced that this is worth doing from every point of view, not just from the nuclear physics point of view or particle physics point of view, but there should be a consensus amongst all these senior uh, August scientists that this is a good idea. And then you get the support that you need for a multi-billion dollar project. So that's what happened in 2018, and I'll talk a little bit about that. When then we realized uh, the technical design for the machine, the collider, which is the machine, this document here, then the experimenters came together and we wrote what we think would be the ideal detector to measure these things. That happened in 2019 to, to now. Basically, we keep on improving that, that design. And we, this was the time of COVID. So we all sat at home and did simulations. Yeah, around the world, about 1,000 people were working on it, from the accelerator, from a theorist, as well as experimentalist. And now we have had another of these long-range planning activities in the US, which has, again, blessed it that this is, has to be built. Let's do it very quickly. So that's another important milestone that happened just last year. So now we are really moving forward to building this. So I will take you through the story of this, the science case of this, uh, through this talk. So we are all always very interested in understanding what is the most fundamental. As scientists, we know what is the smallest thing that we have, we can see in nature, and why is that the smallest thing? So I take you start from matter, and uh, this is an example of a water droplet, and there is a H2O molecule. We understood with chemistry at some point that it was H2O. Then we look and it's a molecule, we find that it's made up of atoms. And for about 100 years now, no, we now know that the fundamental nature of every thing that we see around is an atom. And the atom has a nucleus in the middle and electrons around it. So at some point, people started looking inside the, the atom, we found a hard nucleus, which is at the center of it. And that nucleus is made up of protons and neutrons. We knew this, again, for about 100 years, as of now. And then in 1968, we found that these protons and neutrons were further made up of something called quarks. Those are different types of quarks shown. Uh, for protons, it is U, U, and V quark. For a neutron, it is U, D, and D quark. So I'll tell you a little later why that combination works. However, we also know around that time that they are built, they're bound together by something called the gluons, which are shown here by these small little wiggles here. So those gluons are the ones that bind the quarks together twite, tightly inside the proton, yes? Now imagine that you quarks have positive charge, both of them, fractional charge, but positive charge. You want to bring two positive charges close together, so close together that the size of the proton is of the order of 10 to the minus 15 centimeters. That means that there must be a tremendous repulsion among these quarks. However, these gluons have to overcome that repulsion and make sure that the quark never leaves the, the proton out in its natural state. So that's why the gluon has to be very strong. In fact, we call that force the strong force. The nuclear force is called strong force because of this. It has to overcome this extreme high repulsion amongst like charges. Yes, that's the origin of the word strong force. So remember this, it will come back, yeah? So we now know that this is, has been the case, but how, do we, how did we figure this out? I mean, all the time we need to figure out, we need to have a method for, for such a doing things. And the method is very simple. We have a microscope, and here is a microscope. Uh, you put something you don't want to see right here, and you look from here. And the light that is ambient in the room, photons, light, from light like this, falls, falls on this, gets reflected in there, 
and then you do a trick, magic trick with the, with the lenses, and you see what is coming out, yes? The wavelength of light is between about 380 to 740 meters, uh, 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 nanometers. The resolution of the microscope is hence about 200 nanometers. <clears throat> so it's of the same order wavelength, yeah? Then you go to the next level, you look at, instead of that, you look at an electron microscope where the wavelength is of the order of 0 0.002 nanometers. <clears throat> Remember that every particle has a dual nature. Remember the quantum mechanics that you learned in the first, second year? That means any particle with a momentum P has a lambda associated with it, a wavelength. If I want to study the size of the object of my fist here, I can have a wavelength that looks like this, or I have a wavelength that looks like this. Which one do you think will be more effective in looking at this size? This one, number one, or this one? Number one, because the size, the, lam the lambda is smaller than the size of that object. You have a larger chance of hitting this. In this one, we'll mostly miss it. So if you want to study something smaller than the proton, you need to have smaller wavelength, that means higher momentum. Yes? Because if you remember in quantum mechanics, lambda is equal to h, Planck's constant, divided by the momentum. So momentum is a denominator. Higher the momentum, smaller the wavelength. That means that you want to study smaller and smaller objects, all you have to do is to increase the energy of the probe. Yes, the probe in this case is the electron, increase the momentum, and you get a smaller lambda. Then you can study small. This is a uniform, is the principle. LHC does the same thing. It's just very high energy. That momentum of the probe is very small, uh, is large, so your lambda is very small. So you're looking for substructure of the quark, physics beyond the standard model. Yes? If you won't, don't want to study physics beyond the standard model, but structure of the proton, you need a wavelength that is matched with the size of the proton. So that's what we did, and that's what uh, Gunnar and myself have been doing over the last 20 years. We have an electron accelerator, it hits the target, and then we look at what comes out. And typically it's about 20 GV electron means the wavelength is about 0 0.01 femtobar, uh, femtometer. Remember, this is nanometer, this is femtometer now. The resolution is about 0 0.1 femtometer. The size of the nucleus is about 6 fem for me. Femtometer, yeah? And so now you can see that why we want that wavelength. Typically, that's the ballpark number that we want. And so that's what the basic idea is, that to control the P and measure this as understand. So this is what has happened over the last 50 years. And this is what we think now today's standard model is. Here are the quarks that I will be talking about mostly. U, D, charm, strange, top and bottom. These quarks have a charge of two-thirds and positive, and these have a charge of minus one-third. The only things that we know which have fractional charges. And now you can explain why proton, which was U, U, D, is two-thirds plus two-thirds minus a one-third is one, and if a neutron is two-thirds minus one-third minus one-third. Yeah, that's a simple arithmetic reason why a proton is U, U, D, and a neutron is U, D, D, that I showed you before. Now, these are the neutrinos, which you know are very in-interacting particles. They don't like to interact too much. They can pass through Earth 40 times before the one interaction can happen. And then these are the probes, electron, muon, and tau on. There's the light, they're not the lightest of the, of, the, of the leptons, but they're the light particles compared to the, the ones that we see here. And then these are the gluons, photons, Ws, and Zs. These are three together as the electroweak force exchange particles. These are massive, this is the massless one, and the last one here is the Higgs, that is now being quoted as the origin of mass, which gives mass with interactions with nature to everything that you see here, except maybe the neutrinos. We don't know exactly where the mass of the neutrino comes from. But rest of the particles here, the mass of this comes from the Higgs interactions, the Higgs mechanism. And I'll come back to that a little later. The problem with our now standard model is, these are not detectable individually because they are tightly held inside because of the glue inside the proton. Then these are absorption length is very, very long. 
so hardly interact with matter, so it's very difficult to do experiments with them. These are unstable, they all decay into something that is, this is not detectable because it's also inside the proton all the time, it is, and I'll come back to that a little later, and the photon and the electrons are the only real friends of experimentalists. You can do any experiment eventually that you can do that, right? You have to play with it, you have to manipulate. If you want to do muon experiment, tauon experiment, you have to do something tricky, knowing their properties to understand it well, yeah? So that's the challenge for the experimentalist. So we'll be focusing mostly on the gluon. So what distinguishes the gluon from a photon? That is quantum chromodynamics from quantum electrodynamics, yes? Those are the two things. The photon is the carrier of electromagnetic force, mostly the, on, on our discussion today, and the gluon is the, is the carrier of the color force or the strong force. So the difference is that the photon is charge zero. It has no positive or negative charge. It's neutral. But the strong interactions have three colors in them, three charges for them, and that's why we call them three colors. They're not actually colored, but something that is three in number. And nature tells us that they have to be neutral. A mix of the three is everything that is visible. We call it color neutral particle. Yeah? Everything that is color neutral is visible to us. Yeah? That's the condition of QCD, quantum chromodynamics. The gluon happens to have three colors as well, unlike the gluon, uh, the photon, which means that the photon cannot interact with another photon. It can interact with any charged particle, but photon being zero charge, it cannot interact. Where the glue is different. Gluons can interact with another gluon because they have different color. Yes? And that gluon-gluon interaction distinguishes fundamentally everything between QCD and QED. And that's the biggest thing that you have to remember in this talk. Everything that you're going to learn is based on this particular difference. The gluons carry color, photons do not. Both are massless, but they do not have the same interaction uh, ability. And that results in this kind of diagram. So you have an electron here or a quark that can then interact and uh, emit a gluon that looks like this. And same thing with for a quark or electron with a photon. So these interactions happen both in QCD and QED. But an interaction like this where one gluon interacts with two others, that means one gluon is splitting into two or two is merging into one, however you want to interpret this depending upon, this you will never see in a photon. So there is no equivalence of this here, there is no equivalence of the four photon interaction either. So once you understand this, the entire talk the science of EIC is very clear. This is the difference between QCD and QED. All right, so now, this can result in very, very interesting properties that result because of this. This is really, really the important difference between them, and one has to be appropriate to that. So the properties of the hadrons are emergent properties. That means these interactions of quarks and gluons collectively how many quarks and how many gluons are there inside a proton? We don't know. It's large numbers because if you have a quark, it can radiate a glue. If you have a gluon, it can radiate two gluons. This continuously, as long as the energy inside them is not zero, there's no absolute zero, they will keep on interacting with each other. And somehow, through the collection of billions of quarks and gluons together, the property of the proton is formed. Property of the mass, property of its spin, you know, there is a proton has a spin property. You put a proton in a magnetic field, it points to one direction, right? We know that. Your medical images, MRIs, etc., use that property. You put it in an accelerator, LHC runs with a proton which is spinning in one direction, yes? Rick runs with one direction and we can move them, yeah? So that proton spin property comes from somehow this collective behavior and interactions of quarks and gluons and nothing else. They have to come from those. Those emergent phenomena result not only from the equation of motion of QCD, but they are also tied to the QCD vacuum. Without gluon, there will be no nucleons, no atomic nuclei. It's a really profound statement because the quarks could not be held together. Protons could not form at the beginning of the universe. 
Yeah? When quark gluon plasma existed, it cooled. And the first time we, what happened was the protons were formed. How did the proton get formed? What really triggered that thing is something we are trying to understand coming from a different world. There would be no visible world without those gluons. Yeah? So that's really an important thing. And we need experimental insight and guidance to understand all of that. So let me explain to you a little bit of a puzzle. The proton mass puzzle. You know that the Higgs boson, Higgs boson was discovered in 2012, got a Nobel in 2013, for the discovery of Higgs, which we understand it to be the origin of mass. Now, origin of mass has a caveat to it. Origin of mass means it gives the mass to the massive particles in the standard model. So all the quarks and the leptons get masses, except for the neutrinos, we are not sure yet, except for the, the, the light particles, electron, muon, tau on, and all the quarks seem to get the mass from the Higgs interaction. So now from a nuclear science point of view, or look at it from the higher level, what happens to the mass of the quarks? If you take the U, U, and D quark, and you sum those three quarks together, it comes down to about 2 times 10 to the minus 26 grams. That's about 2 percent, or 1 and a half percent, of the mass of the proton, which actually looks like this. That means the same three quarks, but lots of gluon interactions in them. So the 98 percent of the mass of the proton and the neutron seems to come from the interactions, not from Higgs. And those interactions are color interactions, which means that the gluons are involved. So it's the gluons which are massless by themselves, but carry the color, seem to impart 98% of the mass of the proton. But how exactly that happens, we still don't understand. Yes? So that's something that we want to understand. We want to split and understand what are these interactions? How do they come up with the exact mass of the proton? The same with the neutron. We need to understand it. But it's not just a proton and neutron problem, because every nucleus that we see in the visible world including all the galaxies and everything around, are made up of these protons and neutrons, which means that we still don't understand about 98% of the origin of the mass of the visible world. So that's the profound statement that one has to start with. And that's something that we will try to understand. Where is the rest of the mass coming from? And that's a big question. It's not a small question. This is a picture of the universe as we know it from this wonderful uh, astrophysical observatory. And what we are trying to understand is where is the 98% of the mass coming from. Yeah? And we want to look inside and understand it. So now let me look at the spin question. So your proton has a spin, spin half. And that is shown here. Yeah? Now it, is, it has to come from the, its internal dynamics. That means some of it has to come from the fact that the quarks are sp also spins, like the small spin half particles, they are fermions. The simplest picture when we both started our careers was that those quarks can just align themselves. So two quarks align this way and one quark inside, uh, inside the proton is aligned this way and you have a spin half, spin half, spin half or minus spin half. We thought it was the case, but in 1989, 90, in our experiment at CERN, we first discovered that actually that doesn't work that way. Only 20% of the spin of the proton comes from the quark alignment. Then for the last 20 years, we have been looking for how does the gluon contribute? At RIC, and I'll mention it a little later, we found that only 25% of the rest of the proton uh, uh, spin also comes from gluons. So again, we have the same problem. We have 25 coming from quarks, 25 coming from the gluons alignment, where is the rest of it? Yes, it has to come from the dynamics that I just mentioned, because these, these things are not stationary inside the proton. The quarks and gluons must be moving. But they are finite. If they are moving this way, proton size is finite, it means automatically that they have to turn around somewhere. So intuitively we figure out there has to be a transverse motion, which in modern language is called transverse momentum distributions or TMDs, but they also must be turning around continuously, which has to impart it an orbital angular momentum. But we need to measure it. We need to see the evidence of it directly, which we haven't seen. We have seen the indirect evidence of it, and that's something that we will measure in the future. That means we'll respect the proton 
not as being a one dimensional object, but a multi dimensional object with lots of activities which are going on and try to really understand this 25%, that 25% and what is the angular momentum. What would be wonderful is, well, let me mention that. If you take, uh, there is actual evidence, the people who are, some of you are doing TMDs, the transverse momentum distributions. Most of it was, 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 uh, was emerged out of experimental observation that you take a target which is not polarized, but you take a proton which is polarized and hit it with single spin, okay, one proton. And of course, when you hit a nucleus of something with a proton, lots of pions and protons and, you know, depending on energy, kaons and all these subatomic particles are formed. But they, we observe that pi pluses, which are U d bars in the quark structure, go in one direction. And pi minuses go in another direction. What does that even mean? Yeah? Keep that in question in mind. It means that U d bar, you remember the principal component of the proton was U because there were two U quarks and one D quark. And principal component of a neutron was D, two D quarks and one U quark. And the proton is hitting another proton, you have lots of U quarks. So you see a lot of pi pluses because it's lots of, it's pi on heavy, and they seem to go to the left. If you switch looking for pi minuses, they seem to go to the right. So something was not symmetric. We knew that for a long time, but we couldn't understand it. We could not figure out. And I'll show you how that might be happening, and that's connected to these transverse momentum distributions. But along with transverse momentum distribution come this orbital motion that has to be there somehow. And it would be wonderful if we can now create this whole picture together, and not only that, but can we then connect it to the energy of this energy, you know, remember the quarks and gluons give the energy that is equivalent to 98% of the mass of the proton. It is the energy that is connected to this. But that energy has to come from the motion of these things. If the motion is also connected to the spin, eventually I would like to see that the same spin is creating all the mass. We are far, far away from these answers, whether it is true or not. But it is an intuitively emergent answer, which we would like to understand in the next 10 to 20 years. Let me show you one more problem the parton distribution functions. How is the momentum of each quark inside the proton has been measured by the experiment that we did together at Hera in, in DAISY in Germany. Uh, here is an aerial view of the collider. Uh, this was the experiment I was part of. This was the experiment which was our competitor. And I think your sit sat here, right? The Hermes experiment sat here, uh, the spin experiment there. But no matter, we measure those parton distribution functions. What is plotted on the x-axis here is the fractional momentum of the parton of the, of the proton, which means if the proton is moving with some momentum, and if I measure the parton, the momentum of a single parton, what is the fraction? If the U quark is moving with 10% of the momentum of the proton, then the value on this would be 0.1. It's just the ratio of the momentum of the parton to the total momentum of the proton. Yeah, simply the ratio. All the sum together, if you sum all of those together, it should give you the momentum of the proton because that's the components of the proton are shown there. And what you see here is that the U quarks, the D quarks, the anti D quarks, they're all in this region here. This is the smallest we could see at that time. But what is very, very clear is the gluon's momentum fraction is huge. You see that? It rises very, very high. What does that mean even? As you go to smaller and smaller momentum fraction, that means each gluon carrying a very small amount, 1% is here, 0.1% is here. But the number of these gluons is very large. So you're looking for a smaller and smaller momentum fraction, resolution of your machine, and you are getting a very, very large number. Now, that's by itself is not surprising. The problem is this, that I don't see anything that saturates. This keeps on going like that. How can that be? How can you have an infinity in a, in a, in a picture like this, which is a measured experimental observation? Yeah? 
because you know the total momentum of the proton, it's a finite energy object. You cannot have infinities inside. So that's a problem. We cannot imagine something that just keeps on going like infinity. Something has to give. What it is that we don't know yet? Well, we, we have an idea. QCD tells us what should happen, but we have not seen it. And that's something that we want to do, uh, really explore at the future uh, collider. So to give you an example, so we're going to try to explain what happens here. Why is it that the smaller the momentum gluons keep on rising like this? So I'm going to show you a cartoon of a proton in a fixed target experiment. Here, the proton is just sitting there. What's happening inside? There are these three quarks, and there is something inside there. And this is a function of time, OK? This is not the quarks coming out of the proton. That's my bad drawing. But the cartoon just tells you the time evolution. That's it, yeah? It's all inside the proton. So these are these quarks, and they have some energy. They can emit this glue. And the gluon can then split into another gluon right here. Gluon going into two gluons, remember? Because they carry color. That's possible, but they can merge back into the quark. And this keeps on happening. And then I do an experiment. I zap it with the electron or a muon and see how many do I see in that. And this is the picture here. And you can see, if I did this experiment literally, then I will ask, tell me how many protons, how many quarks, and how many gluons are there. If you did this experiment and this was the result, you will say, oh, there were these three valence quarks, important quarks that carry all the momentum, most of the momentum. And then there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 11 glue that you could figure out. So that's the example. Now think about it, the Gedanken experiment. Think in your mind, what happens to a accelerated proton? Suppose now I don't have a stationary proton, but it is almost at the speed of light. Here is the cartoon for that. Now, to show that, I have shown a Lorentz contracted proton. Proton is now Lorentz contracted. Everything inside is at a very high velocity, yes? Now what happens? The same interaction I'm going to show you here, but now look, the gluon is lasting a little longer. Why does that happen? Relativity tells us something, right? The time dilation effect is important. Time goes a little slow at very high accelerations, yes? So you can imagine that the proton fluctuations that you saw here are time dilated in strong interaction time scales. So the gluons live longer slightly longer. Each of those gluons is going to live a little longer. That means it has the higher probability to splitting into two gluons, but those are already, already boosted, so they will also live longer. Those can split into two gluons and keep on going until they are allowed to come back again. So now if I do zap this, you will see that there is a very clear evidence of more gluons. So what is happening is that a gluon splits into two gluons. Those two can go into four, four can go into eight, and this has to be under a energy conservation. The total energy is still conserved inside, yes? So that means that the energy being conserved, each next level of gluon that is generated is at a higher momentum or higher, uh, lower momentum or lower energy to compensate for the number. That is exactly the process that you saw in this picture. At lower momentum fraction, the number of gluons is growing. That is the physical understanding of this picture, intuitive understanding of this picture. But we have experimentally never seen it. That's the problem. Experiment has never seen a clear evidence of something that, that, that controls this. You know where it is coming from, but you then expect something else to happen. Yeah? And what is that? Does this growth, this growth is infinite? It's a question we have to ask and then find it experimentally. And that's what we are going to do in this future experiment. So because now I want to summarize this whole thing by giving you a, a feel for a number. Protons were discovered 1920s. Atom was discovered, the sound the same thing. 100 years since both were discovered. Atomic structure, yes? We know for 100 years now. The electronic structure of the atom is so well known because the interactions are photonic, QED, very well understood, to the level 
that the current accuracy is one second in 220 million years. That's the resolution of the best atomic clock these days. In fact, you define what one second is looking at a transition in cesium atom. That's the precision at which we are now at. If I wanted to build a, a QCD clock today using an atomic structure, as a nuclear structure or the proton structure, then I estimate that the uncertainty is 20 to 30 percent, which means 20 minutes in an hour. You can judge your time better without a clock than this. But that's the translation. Okay? This is the knowledge of internal structure of proton we have so far compared to QED. Yeah? So that's what we want to change very drastically in the future. And this all because of gluons and these multi-gluon interactions that make calculations very, very difficult. So I'm going to summarize all I've said so far. So how are the C quarks and gluons and their spin distributed in space and momentum? And how do they emerge into the mass and the spin of the proton? That was the mass structure. What happens to interactions inside the nucleus when I hit a parton, a quark, or a gluon inside a proton inside a nucleus? What are these kind of interactions that happen? Yeah? And at some point when this system comes out, I told you that QCD demands that there has to be a color neutral object created. It can be a pion or a kion, but it has to be colorless. How does that happen? It's a deep rooted unknown called confinement or color confinement. Why does nature force this on us? We don't understand. And that's something that we would want to understand. And they are also, what are the interactions with the nuclear binding? How are the interactions that are going on inside? And last but not the least, I mentioned to you what happens to parton distributions inside a nucleus. The question that we have, we will ask, is that is there a saturation of that gluon curve? And what would be the reason for it? The reason is simple. You're inside the proton. The gluon number density is growing. It's like in you being a train and a lot of people around there, you're going to start touching each other, bumping into each other, yes? And that bumping is going to create a merging of the two gluons because they are also colored. So as you increase the number of gluons because of that splitting, at some point, because the whole system is confined, there has to be a renorm, you know, a, a merging of the two. And at some point, these two, uh, a, a, um, gluon emission and gluon recombination, they have to become equal because the volume is finite. And at that point, the gluon number density should saturate. And that saturation would reflect in that gluon curve becoming flat. And that's something that we have not seen yet. That's something we want to see. So that became the physical nature of our argument for this future collider. That is what we presented to this National Academy of Sciences in July of 2018, or actually 2017. They took one year, and they came up with this consensus report, study report, as an assessment of the US-based electron ion collider science. And they said that the science was compelling, fundamental, and timely. Compelling and fundamental is about science. But timely was important, too, because to do what we are planning to do, it requires a collider which is at the frontier of R&D. It pushes the, the properties of the machine to an extreme level. I'll show you what, what happens. We, we don't have, it's not easy to build this collider. It also pushes the detector technologies to great, get all of these two together. But third important thing is that if you build it, and if you take that data, our friend theorists have to analyze it, acknowledge it, and interpret it in terms of QCD and understand what is behind all this. The data will give you data. Data is just data. You will see some results, you'll see, but then you have to interpret it. And that has to also come up. And so all three are together, go together, and that was why this was very, very important from our point of view, because they would have said either one of them was not right, and the whole project would have really gone down. They agreed that the physics should be emergent mass, spin, and the high-density gluon fields. They also agreed in this paper that we wrote, we said we want a luminosity 
of 10 to the power 33 to 34 per centimeter square per second. Now look at that. I haven't used the word that luminosity yet. Luminosity just means luminous. How intense are the collisions? How often the partons, the protons and the electrons see each other? Yeah? So in a per square centimeter area, how many collisions can happen per second? Yes? If you increase the luminosity, more collisions will happen between the electron and the proton. Yes? That's a simple interpretation of that. And that is about 100 to 1,000 times more than the machine that I showed you, the previous EP machine. That's important. We're going to go really broad. We want to use a center of mass energy of about 20 to 140 GeV. We want polarized beams. We want a broad range in nuclei. And we want up to two detectors to, to do this physics. All of that was done. Now, some people who are not in the field say, why do you need another collider? You, you, you asked for spin. There was a collider that was built for you at RIC. We asked for proton spin. Remember I told you gluons, we measured the gluon distribution using those polarized protons after we discovered that the quarks were not going. And the argument was the protons were mainly built of gluons. And if the CERN experiment and the DAISY experiment were telling us that the quarks don't carry much of the spin, let's do the experiment with gluons. And what better thing to use than the, the proton itself? So he said, we gave you one collider. Now you're telling me you not need another one. So here is the difference between the two. So if you wanted to study the structure of watermelon, you can do this experiment which is you take two watermelons at very high momentum and velocity and you collide them, yes? <laughs> that's, that's what you form. And that's what we've been doing at LHC and at RIC. Two watermelons colliding. If I ask you, look at this and tell me what the watermelon is made up of, you can tell me. You can tell me it is made up of the seeds, it has this red meat, it has the nice cover, and you can touch it and see how soft and hard it is, but that's about it. If I ask you, how are the seeds distributed inside the watermelon? In this kind of a collision, you cannot do that. You need a different kind of collision. And you need this kind of collision. You need a knife cutting the watermelon exactly as you want it. You can make it an XY cut or a YZ cut. And now you can tell me the distribution of seeds and the, and the, and the meat exactly how it is. Why can you do it? Because the knife is, is sharp, and when you collide it with a watermelon, it doesn't break. In the first example, one watermelon was a target, another watermelon was a probe. In this case, I have a watermelon to study with, and I have a knife that cuts it. The electron or the muon doesn't break, it's a fundamental particle. So, and it has a very small size. So I can use it very controlled way to cut the proton or the nucleus. And that's why this method is much, much more powerful and works. So that's what non-violent collision, so violent collision in DIS, but with electron is what we are going to use in the future. Now, a little bit more quantitative, and I want to emphasize one, one aspect of it. So you have the electron comes through, exchanges this virtual photon with a wavelength that is smaller than the size of the proton. So I can sew inside, and this proton is right here. Now I can start looking at what's going on. Okay? Now, the first thing I want to emphasize is that momentum exchange, Q, remember that? That had to be connected to the wavelength. Okay, that's the measure of resolution. That's the four momentum. That's the change in the momentum of the final state to the initial state. Yes? We know the momentum and the energy and the angle of the electron in a collider because machine guys tell me where it is coming from and it's exchanged and the proton is sitting in the fixed target experiment, but coming from the other side in a collider experiment, yes? But no matter, you can do this resolution, and you can resolve it, and you find that the Q squared is simply connected to the initial energy of the electron, the final energy of the electron, and the scattered angle of the electron. It has nothing to do with the target. It is the probe, yes? Now, I go to the next level, elasticity. How elastic or inelastic the collision was. You want an inelastic collision, right? You want to see inside. It can be a glazing collision because then you don't see the inside of the proton. So it has to be elastic. 
uh, inelastic. That means the inelasticity, which is again, four vector equation is here. But if you resolve it, you will find that amazingly enough, it can be measured with the scattered electron, initial electron, and the scattered angle. And then you put the value of x, the Bjorkian x, the fractional momentum that I showed you where the gluon was rising, the x-axis of it was that momentum fraction. And that comes out to be this. And that is q squared by y, again this one and that one. S is just the four times the energy of the hadron and the electron. Everything here is known. And all you need to measure is the scattered electron and the angle. And how well can you measure? You can put more money in a calorimeter and make it very, very precise. Yes? So now you have that control over the knife. You can now control the knife. You can look at the scattered electron everywhere. You can look at it from this angle, in phi symmetry, in theta symmetry. You can change energies. You can change the momentum. That means the resolution is changing. All of that is given by the fact and can be done because you have the electron and you have full control over it. And that is why deep inelastic scattering has seen all the internal structure. All the major discoveries that have happened in physics have come because of this. There were Nobel Prizes, and all of them related to that. We in, in, in the first and the second interactions, etc. So then what we can do that we can either do this simple process. We only look at the scattered electron. And that means I need some 100 events, let's say. But if I can be more ambitious, I want to know what quark was hit. That means I have to put around the collision area something called the particle identification detectors. Cherenkov counters, time of flight counters. I'll tell you a little bit about them. But particle identification can be an added requirement in a detector. Yes? So I put more money in it. Not only I see electrons, but I see pions or kaons. Then I know what quark was hit inside. And that's called semi-inclusive deep inelastic scattering. And then I can be even more ambitious. Not only can I see that part, but I'll see remain and nucleus. So I break the proton or the nucleus. Then I see everything comes out in all directions. But more importantly, I also look at what remains going forward in the target. Yeah? This is very difficult to do in any other way. Because if you give it a momentum, something will keep on going in the front. It carries some information, but we've never been able to measure it. At HERA, we couldn't measure it because we didn't know it was important. Now we know it is important, so we're going to measure that as well. So you need high luminosity and acceptance because of that. And that's why the detector becomes complicated and also expensive. Yeah? So we have to balance it. So will we do this? You know, this is the same x-axis momentum fraction that I showed you before. Here are the past experiment. On the y-axis is the resolution how resolved your photon is, or Q squared. And you see the past experiments, the electron experiment that was done at DAISY sits here. The muon experiments are here. Our past experimental effort at RIC are sitting here. What we will want to do is to go in this direction in which we go to the low x, extremely low x, then to the power of minus 4, minus 3, where the gluons were rising like that. Yeah? And study these structures there. Similarly, on this side here, this is nuclei, again the same fraction. This is inside the nuclei. These are the fixed target experiment. And what EIC, or we want to go in the future, is to go in the direction of low x and high q squared. Yeah? This is where we want to go, and that's what we want to collider for. So, for example, what would come out? Here is the, uh, the, the contribution from the quarks and the gluons of the spin half, and that's the angular momentum of the quarks and angular momentum of the gluons. Yes? That's the total spin that I showed you before. And that's that same equation. Now I'm going to pick the number that we know today from delta, from this quark contribution is put it out here. And the gluon distribution contribution is on this axis here. Now this is the current uncertainty. Well, this was five years ago. But this is the current uncertainty in the knowledge of these two. And you can see the values are such large numbers that this one is a very small number. You can't live with this forever. I mean, you need to do better than that. And the uncertainty is that the electron machine allows us to go is shown here with different combinations of energies of the, of the beams in the future collider. So
So that's what we want to do. So you, we don't know whether it will finally come out to be, but it can, it can be here, it can be there, but no matter, the uncertainties are much smaller than the blue that we have so far. And that is what's important in experimental physics. Reduce the uncertainty that you start understanding what's going on. Now, my theory is, and from there, of course, you can subtract and figure out what is going on with the orbital motion of the quarks and gluons. That's something that we can figure out simply by one minus doing it. It's cheating, but that's the first, first thing that we will do before we get to the, and I'll show you how to measure that explicitly. Our friends on the lattice QCD are already calculating these things. So they have a nice result. Over the last four or five years, they have been studying to get the fractional momentum of the quarks, angular momentum of the quarks, U to quarks, D quarks, strange quarks, and the total angular momentum of these systems. So the lattice QCD anticipating such kind of accuracy and precision from EIC in 10 years is already getting into the business of measurement. At some point, I'd like to actually measure them one by one. Okay, here's what the lattice QCD tells you. Here's what the experiment is telling you. This is going to happen once we have that. Similarly for the mass. The mass is measured with kinetic energy of the quarks, energy of the gluons. The, there is something called the quark mass associated with it. And there is something called trace anomaly, which is a quantum fluctuation that is connected only to the gluons. Now, all of these can be calculated to some extent. However, because we don't understand the glue-glue interaction that well, this last term is always problematic. And you have to look for very special equations or, 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 uh, or processes in which you create uh, electron-proton scattering and creates these j psi's or epsilons, which are heavy quark objects, which are or had to originate from gluon interactions like this to look for what is what might be going on in there. And that's the kind of thing that we want to measure, to measure this part here. That's the mass problem that I've talked to you before. And there are ways to understand it in the proton, but you can understand this differently with pions and kaons. Pions are two quark systems, kaons are two quark systems, where the gluon's contribution seems to be much smaller. The most of the quark's mass seems to be closer to the total mass. And that's a hint that nature is already giving us to explore there and understand why that is different than a three quark system like a proton. So those are the kind of things that are coming out from the lattice QCD calculations, but we want to measure them again in future. Now here as another example of what we want to do in three dimensions. So you look at this and you know already that's a human being in one dimension, yes? You know that the reality is different. Reality is very different and we want to understand the human being in three dimensions. And that's what we are trying to do also in the proton. We want to understand it in this, the TMDs, the transverse momentum distribution and possible angular momentum. How do we want to do that? And we want to do that and we can't really extrapolate from what we know today into this world of TMDs and world of orbital motion. We can't really extrapolate because we don't have an intuition. Yeah, we, because of those glue on glue on interactions. So I'm going to show you something today to build that case that said intuition is not enough. So I ask you this, based on this resolution, can you guess what this is? Yeah, because, yeah, I'm coming from the city, <laughs> the city, yes? So if I go to higher and higher resolution, you can now see the intuition, right? You have the intuition. He gave you the answer, but I think most people would have found it this time. It's a Statue of Liberty. Why? Because you have biased your mind with it already. It's a famous thing in the world, right? Everyone knows Statue of Liberty. So higher the resolution, that intuition and resolution makes it clear. But the intuition was built because of your knowledge. So if you think that that is the only thing that matters, let me ask you now. And here is a case in which it's not intuitive. Now, if you're an artist, I don't want your answer. Okay, keep quiet. Okay, so this is something that I want you to think about. Because we have no knowledge of transverse 
size and the trans well size we know but but internal transverse dynamics of the proton we cannot extrapolate on our current knowledge because we have zero information technically you know we have ideas so can you guess now i have doubled the answer. at this point he had already solved the problem right in the previous picture he had solved the problem and at this point most of you saw the statue of liberty you still don't see anything here most people don't see you see it you see it oh i'm in the wrong country isn't it <laughs> you recognize it already okay keep quiet oh. <laughs> because it's fun for everyone else now can you guess it now yes i see a lot more yeses and i can let me tell you this is an audience a larger fraction of people have recognized this than anywhere else in the world i'm serious and i think there's a reason for it right if you have the right answer the answer is yes yes okay so it is the painting by salvador dali uh, that says persistence of memory yeah by salvador dali yeah you got it you are an artist too art history okay just a, just a common citizen of bas country yes all right so the argument was not whether you understood this the argument was it's more difficult if you have no intuition to do the calculation salvador dali's mind goes in that direction nature in three dimensional inside activities of the proton in mass creation of mass creation of those transverse momentum distributions or the angular momentum is not intuitive because we have never seen it in experiment it will become intuitive at some point in the future but we don't have that and because we don't have it we cannot really judge this right now we have to go in and measure it so that is the case that i want to make and here is what we want to do and now once you know what we need to do obviously the measurement is simple electron scattering is important now let's see what we have to do there's something called wigner function that existed amongst atomic physicists and a low energy nuclear physicist for a long time we just did not believe or could not imagine that it now would be useful inside the proton as well because we had no way to measure things inside the proton with the kind of control that now we claim to have yeah so we have this function w which is made up of that x the burkean x that i talked to you about the function uh, the the fractional momentum of the parton the bt is just the distance of that of that part on from the assumed center of the proton is just the impact parameter how far is it from the center and kt is the transverse momentum distribution of that so those are the three things that we want to measure of course bt and kt has two dimensions x and y remember that yeah this is because the proton is going in z direction this has kt and xp yeah so that's a five dimensional object that we want to measure they're not some i mean they look complicated but they are very deeply connected to what we have measured in the past so if you integrate over the momentum space what you get out of, of the of the sorry the, the distribution space what you get is the transverse momentum dependent part on distribution functions that's the tmd that people talk about yes if in case you integrate over the coordinate space uh, or going the coordinate space integrate over the kt what you get is the distance dependent part on distribution function yes and then from there you can get into uh, uh regions where you can have to take some some uh, some extrapolations and uh, uh, some transformations and you get something called generalized parton distribution functions which then allow us to go into the technically in the direction of orbital motion etc etc we don't need to worry about the details of it but the idea is this that you either go in the tmd that is the momentum distribution or the coordinate distribution but you have to remember that the x is the same the momentum fraction is the same this is where they merge so for x a range of x you look for tmds and the same range you look for gpds and merge them together into a three dimensional picture and that will hopefully give us the kind of things that we are looking for the momentum and the position distribution gives you the orbital motion because one is arc the other is p arc cross p is momentum distribution so that's the big picture we want to build in this in the future so and again we'll do that with lattice qcd as well so here is that intuition that we want to build so here is a proton inside that 
is now I'm assuming that the quark is moving in that direction here, has an angular momentum. The electron comes through and gets scattered. It kicks the quark in that direction because the momentum was that direction. So momentum is this plus that is resulting is here. And then as it comes out, it picks up an anti-quark and becomes a pion or a kaon. So I see a k1 coming on on this side or a pion coming on this side. And then if you do this multiple billions of times, you will eventually create these MRIs, magnetic resonance images of the quark inside the proton. And by knowing whether it was a pion plus or a pion minus, I will tell you whether it was a U quark or a D quark. If I see kaons in the same thing, I will tell you something about the strange quarks. So, all of these things can be built. We will measure them and then work with our theory friends and say, hey, this is what we see. Now let's build a model together. Try to understand that, remember the timely part of it, that one important part was we produce the data, work with the theorists and come up with a model and understand why is it that is happening. Very similarly, there is transverse position distributions. In this case, I, I want to ask you to imagine one more Gedanken experiment. If I have a glass tube and there is three ping pong balls and some water in it and this is moving and this is a total angular momentum to it and if I ask you okay go and measure that tell me what's going on inside you will not take a baseball bat or a cricket bat or something like this and hit it with it because you'll break the glass everything will fall which means that the motion that you're trying to measure stops happening because you killed it so you have to be more careful so you cannot break the, the glass, which means the same thing here, you cannot break the protons. So you have to go in, which is what is happening with this, and that's my proton. I excite a quark and then that gets de-excited to give a real photon. And in the experiment, I measure the scattered electron from here, a real photon, and an undisturbed, unbroken proton. So EP goes to EP gamma but still go inside to excite that photon. And that photon structure or the spectrum of that photon is very important that tells me something about what's going on inside this quark, inside this, yes, on the spatial structure and the momentum spectrum. Same thing here, we look for a vector boson which is made up of two gluon contributions and you do the same thing with the C with, that is originated in the gluonic interaction. This is the quark interaction, that's the gluon interaction. But the idea is to understand these two-dimensional positions of unpolarized quarks, C quarks and gluons inside in, in this kind of a way that you'll say, okay, I can actually see the distributions of Bx and By when an unpolarized proton is there and polarized proton is there. Again, these are simulations, only tell us about the sensitivity of the experiment. But we will be able to change, see the sensitive to the changes in those distributions is what counts. So what we have done is we have gone one step beyond that. We want to do these as MRIs. So this is what we are trying to do here without breaking the watermelon but looking at an MRI. Now I don't know why there is MRI of a watermelon on the internet but I can use it very easily to make the case of what we are doing to do. Yeah? Now let me go to the last part of the talk in which I want to emphasize again, I think I've said everything that I have already mentioned. This is what we want to understand. Where does that change? Does it change? And if you look at the Nobel uh, lecture of uh, Wilczek, he talks about this. He says that if you have a color interaction because of the glue-glue interaction, the result is a self catalyzing enhancement that leads to a runaway growth that he's talking about here. A small color charge in isolation builds a large color thundercloud. You see, isolation is a very important word. And what he's trying to tell you is that two is going to go to four, four to eight, eight to four, 16, and, and this car keep on going. However, it cannot go to infinity. We know that, right? We know that, it cannot be. The thing really is this word isolation. That is because it's not in isolation. All of this is happening inside the proton. And that means that there is a finite volume and at some point, these things start merging together again. And that merging together is what I had talked about before, should result in the saturation that I mentioned to you before. And that's the key that we want to measure. And how, now, why is it interesting? Well, first of all, it's QCD. 
and we haven't seen such a thing because we haven't seen the turnover. But that turnover creates a gluonic object inside the proton. That's, the, that's what the QCD is telling us. It's a state of gluons where high density of gluons exist, and that's saturated. If you actually do this, so that's what we are trying to do. If you actually did this and find this, theorists have calculated what are the properties of such a saturated state of new matter. And they call it color glass condensate because it's color interactions. It's a condensate because gluon is a spin one object, a large number of gluons are coming together. And glassy because they are not, they, they have a, a viscous feeling that you kick it from one side, you'll see a wave of things going like a, in, in, a, in a viscous object, very viscous object. So let's call it color glass condensate. And the property is that the energy densities can be higher, 50 to 100 times higher than the core of a neutron star. Now we haven't imagined anything like that density in nature. So it obviously asks a question, can we really create this in the lab? Yeah? And that's something that we will try to do as evidence. And what we are going to do is that instead of the proton, we want to increase the number density of the parton. So I'll take the nucleus instead and raise it to light speed. And now look at all these gluons that are inter overlapping together inside the nucleus. Not just the gluons from one proton, but 98 of them and 98 other neutrons together in a nucleus of 198. Try to enhance that effect of high gluon density by going to the nuclei. And that's why we need one of the important reasons in this collider, a very, very large nucleus as well. And here is what we want to study. And there is something called a saturation scale. At what scale does saturation happen? And there is a simple formula for it, estimated again, which is something now, a to the power one third divided by x. The x is the same x. So you want to go to low x, so the denominator is very small, x the same momentum fraction. So that's in the denominator, and the size of the nucleus is shown here. So now you can see, for Hera, that factor was somewhere here in the, this is lambda QCD, is around 0.5. And at EIC, although the total energy of the collider is smaller than Hera, because we have nuclei, we have a natural enhancement in that factor because you have lots of nucleons inside the nucleus. And we'll try to get to, even at 40 GeV or 90 GeV, you get a very large uh, range in this, this, this region uh, of this saturation scale. And that's what we are going to do. That's why it is important to do it. If we can't find it here, then one has to build another big collider to see it or, or find a different way of doing it. But that's really why, why we want to do it. I mentioned to you that it has a property, it is very dense. And when you have something that dense, a jet that is created, a jet of particle that is created, can be stopped by that density, yes? That simple reason why we can actually see it. So if nothing happens, then the EP collider and the EA collision will, with two jets production will look the same, no difference. But if there is this unusual means, the property, uh, unusually dense medium being created, then this will look like that. It will look as if there is a, there is a break in momentum conservation, which we know it will not happen, right? Momentum conservation is fundamental. It has to happen. It's just that the medium that you're creating is so dark and dense that that jet, energetic jet, cannot come out. One of the jet cannot come out. The other one does because it passes through the, one passes through the, presumably the dense part, the other part, chances are you're seeing it outside. Yes? So that's the idea behind the measurement. You want to go in the region of low x and q squared, which is large enough to measure it right here. So you want to go in that direction and see as a function of energy, this jet disappear for the same nucleus. Yeah? So that's the kind of thing we want, to, we want to measure. Uh, let me go a little bit faster now. This is the summary of the program. Here is the center of mass energy. Here is the luminosity that we have mentioned. The density, the last part that I mentioned to you, will require highest energy and the highest nuclear size. The spin measurement that I mentioned to you before here and there, you'll require 10 times large luminosity. And then they finish the project with this tomography, you will need to go to the highest luminosity. So that's the way it falls on the machine parameters. 
Uh, there are other things we can do which are not in the, in the US at least it is not considered as nuclear physics, but there's a lot of particle physics that is, can be done. Studies with protons, with PDFs, the proton distribution function, parton distribution functions that will be connected to LHC upgrades, precision measurement of the strong interaction constant, the B and C quark distributions with 100 to 1000 times luminosity of HERA and with polarization. These are all new things that have never been done. Multi-quark systems that LHCB has discovered, they will have consequence to what we see here, what can be measured there. Jet in distributions, entanglement, entropy, hadronization, confinement, and then some of the standard high energy physics measurements of electroweak physics with some precision beyond the standard model with parity, charge symmetry, lepton flavor violation. All of these are possible in complementary regions to the LHC. So if you are involved with LHC, looking for a postdoc afterwards, you have a place to go and look at it complementarily with, with much more energy in this. There's a large group now, there's a worldwide interest, about 1,500 collaborators from 40 countries have joined and that are shown here with about 290 institutions as of May. Uh, it's a strong interaction participation and you can see it's growing. We are going internationally to various places to run our machines. This summer we'll be meeting in Pennsylvania, United States at university in Lehigh uh, after a visit to Warsaw last year and 2025, we don't know where we're going to meet yet. We will decide it in Lehigh. But you can see it's an international project. It's about 39% of the people are from United States, 30% from Europe, 25% so far from, uh, from, from, uh, so the, from Asia. And then there are other smaller contributions from other parts of the world. I think this is going to grow into a real international project. I've told you that the case for this has been built over 25 years. This was the first document. This was the last document that came in 2023 that said that we should build it and all many, many, many things that happened over the last two decades. And that's something that, uh, that is there. Um, what we are going to do, how we are going to do this is to, at Brookhaven National Lab, we have something called RIC, the Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider, which has been running for 20, 25 years now. We're going to stop running it next year and use the same tunnel, the same tunnel that RIC is in fact, using one of the beams, so you see this blue, the red beam here in this one already exists, this red one dark here. What we'll do is to add to that this uh, injection uh, for the electron and build this part in the same tunnel and then collide it at two different places, the, the location of the first detector and in future we want to build a second detector about five to seven years later. Um, again, the luminosity numbers are these and they cover all the science that I mentioned to you before. The detector collaboration has been formed. It looks like a high energy physics detector. It looks like an asymmetric detector, electron, a hadron coming from this side, electron coming from that side. And you see the need for particle identification is more on one side than the other and in the central region. So you can see that it is, it is a high energy physics uh, uh, detector but with asymmetry because one has an electron lower energy and a very high energy nucleus all coming on the other. The important thing is remember I told you that we want to track the scattered proton or the nucleus very close to the beam pipe because we want to see what happens to the target and all of that requires that the detector which is nine and a half meters sits here but there are lots of detector components that are embedded into the machine far far away 50 50 meters away from the interaction region because we want to see those small changes that happen there. So that is new because we're going to ask the machine to give us the highest luminosity, give us polarization, give us all the nuclei. And by the way, you can't put your machine element there because I want to put a detector there. That is what makes this one of the most complicated interaction regions to be built, but we have achieved it. We think we are, we are going to be there uh, and measure all of these things. So there is a collaboration. The, what I showed you before was the, was the user group. Now a collaboration has been formed for the detector and that's about 500 people which are now working together to realize what I just said. Here's what the detector looks like and different countries contributing to it. Finally, the timeline. Uh, we got the mission approved in 2019 from the DOE. Site selection was January 2020. Um, and then there are some standard, don't worry about what they mean 
But what we are trying to do is now, in this region, March 24 to March 25, we were looking at things that need to be ordered now so that they are available to us in five to seven years. Some of the things we not, cannot just go to the market and buy magnets, right? We want to build them now, so that means we have to make those orders. So that is called the long lead procurement, and that has been approved for about $90 million in March, two months ago, and another approval about another $90 million will happen around March 2025. And the performance baselines starts at 20, end, end of 2025, which means that we start constructing in 2025. And that's about here, right there, the start of construction. There will be about six to seven years of construction, and then there will be a closeout. Closeout means construction project closeout. That means the beginning of physics. So the beginning of physics will be early 2030. And uh, that's when uh, everything starts operating and we start doing physics. So the last slide, the electron ion collider is a high energy, high luminosity polarized electron proton and the first ever electron nucleus collider. Never has this been done. Polarized collisions have never been done in a collider mode. Electron ion collider collisions have never happened in a collider. And it will be running throughout the 2030s. This is where about 20, 15 years of physics will start around 2032 or so. So this is the timeline that people are looking at to do the science. It's uh, international. Uh, the first project detector has been formed. Uh, the collisions, as I mentioned to you, will start around this time here and run for about 15 to 20 years. There's a lot of international uh, interest. You can get involved. CERN has now recognized us as a, a detector. So you can be part of the CERN activities, detector technology. All this does will be done in a common way. For all the early career scientists, which is most of this, if you are interested in nuclear and particle physics, this is a place to consider your career. Even if you are an undergraduate now, the timeline is consistent with your peak of the career. So I invite you to consider this and uh, join us if you can. Thank you very much. I guess I went a lot more over time. I didn't yeah, realize that. Sorry. A little bit. Thank you very much, Avi, for this very inspiring talk. I think there are maybe some questions. The time for some questions. <coughs> comments. Question, comments. You can ask anything you want, as you can see. Most of the time, I'll say I won't know, but because mm -hmm. we really don't know much about it. So no question is uh, too simple a question or too hard a question. They're all the same. Yeah. Yes, thanks for the talk. And uh, I wanted to ask, I don't know very much yet how to spin, but what I have understood if, uh, is that if I have, for example, two one half spins, I have to do this strange combination to get that the options are zero or one. And you were talking about different contributions in 25% and yes. I know, to the proton spin. Yes. I don't know. I don't see how the two, the two things. Yeah. Are how, how, what does it mean? Yes. What does it mean? Twenty-five percent, right? Yeah. So what it means is, um, if you have now this spin half is an ad hoc number, right? It's h divided by two, and that's the that's a quantum of spin. That's the quantum carried by that particle, and we called it a spin half because you put it in a magnetic field, it gives you two types. Two, two orientations. It doesn't mean it could be called 100. It could have been called 100 at that time, right? But it was not. It was called, because of quantum mechanical rules, it was given one and a half uh, spin, spin two, uh, two possibilities. So now the question is, how much of that is coming from the alignment of the quarks? If you knew that the quarks were also spin half, the simplest thing was to do this, 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 and that. And so this and that cancel and the remaining this. So that would be the 100% spin carried by the quark of that proton. How would I see, been seen it in experiment is that, remember the value of x, the x Bjorkin? So if I look at the highest momentum event, then the quark is aligned with the proton all the time because the quark is carrying the proton spin. How often does that happen? 
Then I ask a question, how does that often does at x equal to 0.1 momentum happen? And this, and we can, so on an experiment, I measure it over a large range in x. And then look at how often do quarks contribution to the proton come about. And that's the number that we get, it is 25%. But before we did the experiment, we thought it was all coming from the quarks. And that is the part which is surprising that we realized that the gluons carry a lot more than we initially thought. There was no reason for it to a priori know that because everything else understood, you know, all the models that we existed at that time, you could figure out all the quark interaction, the property of the proton, the size of the proton based on this simple fact that the quarks would spin half particles. We had a finite, uh, finite size and you could calculate things. And they worked, except when we looked for it. Then there was a crisis. So in fact, that was called a spin crisis. Yeah. So that, in that sense, it's a fractional moment, uh, angular momentum carried. Thank you. Make sense? Yeah. No. Well, that tells you that uh, even though you may think you have a nice explanation for something, yeah. always measure it and verify Correct. that in nature it is actually the case. Yeah. Verify. Yeah. I think Experimental there verification. Another. There's another one here somewhere. Thanks. Yes. Um, so you mentioned briefly the neutron stars when talking about color glass condensate. Um, so how is the uh, program of the EIC going to help us um, explore this large density regime of the QCD? Yeah, so, so what we do in the experimental case, uh, we look at the electron nuclear scattering. One of the things we should see, I showed you, that if that is true, then it is so dense that one of the jets that is created, you know, EP creates two jets. This is a standard thing that as people have seen in, in our previous experiment at HERA, in the PP scattering experiment at LHC, you see it all the time, multiple jets being created. So we expect that that is going to happen. We can calculate the probability. We, know, understand, we understand the physics of it. However, if this large density object is being created in the nucleus, when the electron sees it, then, one of the jets will be completely suppressed. So that's the cartoon I showed you before, yes? But there are other things that happen. So only based on that, I will not conclude that I'm successfully shown the existence of this, this new saturated state. Because that's a major big statement about QCD, and you want to have different, you want to have a complete confirmation of it. So I didn't emphasize it there, but one of the things that is dependent on is how much is the momentum of the nucleus? So, because you have to push the nucleus into a pancake at the highest center of mass energy, yes? Then you have the largest overlap of the gluons, and that's when you start seeing this effect. But what if I don't have the highest energy? Then the size of the nucleus is large in the transverse dimension, which means that the energy density might not be there, correct? It will be less than that. If it is less than that, the suppression will be lower. So it will not be a complete absence of the second jet, but a second jet comes with a slower, a lower energy. Then I can reduce it further, and now it makes it even worse. So then I start seeing the full two jet property. So at low energy, I should be able to recreate the two jet, even in EA. At high energy, I should be able to get rid of it. That's one. The second thing is undergraduate physics. So you've done this experiment in which you take a monochromatic light, yes, and then you shine it on a circular object. What happens to the other side? You've seen an experiment, right? Or you take a slit and you shine a monochromatic light. It's called diffraction. Remember the diffraction? Diffraction is light interacting at a sharp object, at a dense sharp object, opaque object, opaque. So you take a cardboard, you shine this light, and then you see the diffraction pattern of maxima and minima on this side. Remember that? Now I'm creating the exact same situation. I have given you a nucleus and I'm telling you it is so dense, it's completely opaque to this light, which means that I should create the diffractive pattern on the front side, in the electron going side. Of what? Of these particles that I create, j psi, upsilon, phi, all these nuclear physics particles, they become my tool for the future measurement because I understand their production. Now I interpret them as that. 
So looking at it in the very front, in the very forward direction, I should see the diffractive-like pattern. Yes? And the last but not the least, the simple plot that I showed you of the gluon distribution that came from something called the F2 unpolarized structure function of the proton. Yeah? It's just the momentum distribution. That's what you saw. And I should be able to measure that with a large nucleus, lead nucleus, uh, or uranium nucleus, carbon nucleus, which is a smaller one, and iron nucleus, which is in the middle. And I should be able to see a gradation of turning over in the regime that we will measure. But all of those things should depend on the energy, remember? Because it is only being created at the highest energy or created strongly in the highest energy. Meaning each one of those effects, the diffractive pattern, the absence of the nuclear, uh, the dijet, the bending of the F2 structure function, all of them are identically reproduced at different energies. Yes? Then I will have a confidence in saying, aha, I have seen what I expect from QCD. If this effect is true. Yeah? And that's why you need the collider, which has not only the proton, but the nuclei, but many nuclei, and also needs to have the energy variability. Because to change, to go into that effect and go out of it, you need to change the center of mass energy, the collision energy of the nucleus. That has not happened in any collider before with that precision. Every time you change the energy of the collider, the luminosity drops to such a level that you cannot make physics sense anymore. We tried it at HERA uh, in the last run and the luminosity really drops. For the kind of studies that we want to do, we cannot live with that kind of a drop in the luminosity. So that's why the machine is special as well, yeah, other than the spin. So all of Thanks. that has to be there. Thank you. Well, uh, thanks for the talk. It's, it's made my, my teaching easier, actually. Uh, next week, they have to be exposed to deep inelastic scattering, as a matter of fact. Now you know, you, can know, you don't go to the class then. Right? And, and he was asking you about the spin, but uh, actually today he had in front of him the spin flavor. Ah, okay, uh, very good. Uh, wave function for the protons, things like yeah. that. Uh, back to things, you mentioned lep lepton flavor in universality violation. Uh, so if you remember so this, I'm actually in DSTAR, whatever, what's, so the, what's the science case for EIC for that particular LHC thing. upgrade? So, so you can so look at, we, we have looked at, power, we can look at possibility of looking at EP goes to tau plus P, tau, E to tau transition. We have also looked at E to mu transition. The regions are very complementary to HERA and to LHC. The phase space is very complementary. However, we have determined that E to mu we will not win because muon comes from various pion and k on decays. So the background in a signal that we will see is, is going to be very difficult. And the, the dedicated experiments to, for mu to E transition will be so much more precise than us that we will not compete. However, there are very few experiments ever done for E to tau transition, or tau to E, the first family to third. And there we can win because the tau decays into three pions. It's a one how it was discovered at LEP. And there is a very clean signal, which we can see very clearly. And the upper limits are, if we see it, we'll be lucky if we don't see it. Even if we don't see it, the, brand, the, the limits of precision that we have estimated for our machine are better than what are being discussed in any experiment so far. Now, Bell 2 might come by that time and do something else and really figure something out, but that's, then will be a complementary measurement. Depends upon how that goes. But it's an example of what we can, the power of that collider that you can do. Yeah. So I think, uh, also in view of the time, uh, we close the session. We'll thank again, Abe, for thank the you. very nice talk. Thank you.